if you are a fanatic, purist, you prohibit yourself to enjoy. But then all of a sudden you discover yourself enjoying the very rituals of prohibition. Let me begin. Years ago, I was reading a text about how the Nazis tortured prisoners in the concentration camps. It affected me quite dramatically when I found that they used industrially made testicle crashers, like to crack nuts. They made them industrially to torture prisoners in concentration camps. Now, I did something. I didn't want to be caught lying <laughs> again. So I simply went to Google or whatever and put a, 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 a testicle crasher or ball crasher to get the data. I was extremely surprised when I got an answer immediately, but not about the Nazis. I got a couple of websites, advertisements, where they say, pick your poison for pleasure from this ball torture group. <laughs> then you have stainless steel ball crusher, stainless <laughs> ball clamp torture device, brutal cock vice torture toy, and so on and so on. I think that this passage from the ball crasher used to torture prisoners in Nazi concentration camps to the ball crasher that you can buy, they're very nicely done, even <laughs> with some small diamonds for, for, for 500 uh, uh, pounds. This will undoubtedly be celebrated as a sign of historical progress. The same progress which brings us classic works of art purified of the content they m that may hurt somebody. So that's where we are. You shouldn't use a wrong word like he or she when it should be they, but you get all the pain <laughs> that you want from a ball crasher. <laughs> uh, the question that bothers me today is, uh, I'm not uh, uh, against this. I think that these ball crashing machines and so on are not a pathological phenomenon, that they indicate something that is immanent to our sexuality. So why does the permissive stance towards sexual pleasures entail impotence and frigidity? Why, when pleasure is enjoined by a superego figure, are we deprived of it? Why, in these conditions, the only way is to enjoy through pain? I'm raising here, of course, the old Freudian question. Why do we enjoy oppression itself? That is to say, power, edifice, asserts its hold over us, not simply by oppression or repression, they are not the same, but which are sustained by a fear of punishment. Power asserts itself by bribing us for our obedience and enforced renunciations. What we get, get in exchange for our obedience and renunciation is a perverted pleasure in renunciation itself, in loss itself. Here comes a uh, 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 very nice ambiguity of Lacan's term for surplus enjoyment, plus de jouir. If you know minimally French, you know that plus de can mean a surplus, but it can also mean negative, no longer enjoyment. So uh, uh, Lacan uh, 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 formulated this term <laughs> with a reference, of course, to Marx, mere wert, surplus value. Lacan added surplus uh, enjoyment. Uh, and Freud already doesn't have a term, but called this Lustgewinn, a gain of pleasure, which does not designate a simple stepping up of pleasure, more pleasure, but the additional pleasure provided by the very formal detours in the subject effort to attain pleasure. Another figure of this Lustgewinn is the reversal that characterizes hysteria. Renunciation to pleasure reverts into pleasure of renunciation. Repression of desire reverts into desire for repression. And I think I am here, although we are enemies theoretically, but personally normal relations, here I agree with her. I refer her to uh, uh, Judith Butler, 
uh, where she develops in one of her texts about psychoanalysis very nicely this point of how, yes, enjoyment is impossible, direct, pure enjoyment. But at the same time, you cannot get rid of enjoyment. For example, if you are a fanatic, purist, you prohibit yourself to enjoy. But then all of a sudden you discover yourself enjoying the very rituals of prohibition. And Lacan's point is that <laughs> there is no zero level pure enjoyment, non-oppressed enjoyment, which would then be repressed and so on. No, enjoyment is as such uh, 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 an excess. This brings me now to uh, uh, this. Goebbels, uh, Goebbels' uh, speech, again, I think that this uh, speech, as already said, stands for pure sublime. In the sense of his messages, you think you've already seen enough suffering, no way, you will suffer immediately more. And the result is a quite open, obscene, enjoyment. Now, uh, uh, now comes my trick. Maybe you will say, but wait a minute, wasn't this all staged? My point, it doesn't matter. The way ideology works today and already in the Nazi time is that the most dangerous false distance is when you tell yourself, uh, oh, but I'm not taking it seriously. No, it is serious and you are not aware how serious it is. Or Freud has a very nice formula for this when he says we are not only more immoral than we think, our id yes, is also more moral than we think. So again, where is here the surplus enjoyment? In Goebbels' speech, it is produced by the very renunciations he imposes on the people. A look at his distorted face when he shouts his challenges to the public is enjoyment at its purest. And now I come to the pessimist, sad conclusion, is in killing the Jews, the surplus is produced by the very fact that brutal murder is presented as the highest duty. So that while I enjoy, I can tell myself that I'm doing my duty. I improvised a little bit on this already <laughs> yesterday, how for me the most depressing, horrible thing is that, uh, uh, and I gave yesterday two examples, not only the Nazis, but also in a different way, I don't confuse them, the Stalinist terror in Gulag. You know, the really depressive thing is that like, we all have some sense of common decency. But to uh, uh, present you to you as the highest ethical challenge, that you are ready to sacrifice your common decency for the good of the nation, for the high cause, and so on and so on. For example, Heinrich Himmler, the really bad guy, the uh, uh, chief of uh, uh, SS and so on, he put this at its purest. In his message to uh, SS officers killing the Jews, he said, when you are confronted with a Jewish lady and her small son, both of are already covered by blood, crying, totally helpless, there comes the greatest ethical temptation that if you feel sympathy for them. The highest ethical stance is to ignore this common decency and to do it. And even Himmler comes close to saying this, that every idiot can be seduced, like he did it here, by giving his life for his country. And him, no, the highest ethical act is to sell your sell your soul to the devil to do the most horrible things as the highest ethical duty. And I found, again, repeating myself from yesterday, in some Stalinist uh, notes in the early 30s when they did uh, 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 the collectivization, it was the same when they were preparing uh, uh, people to go to the villages and forced farmers into collectivization, they said, you will do the most horrible things. You will have to ignore small, starving children, families. But he says, there is the 
temptation. They call this temptation, of course, bourgeois sentimentalism, liberalism, and so on. That and uh, now you will say, but this is uh, an exaggeration. No, I don't have time now to go into this in detail, but uh, uh, I found traces of this today clearly in also in Russian, but especially American alt-right, alternative right. Uh, 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 DeSantis, Trump, and all of them are mostly giving the same message. They say, Trump openly says a couple of months ago that uh, our sense of justice, that he won really the elections and so on, allows us to ignore even the Constitution. You see, and here things get, but I will not go into it <laughs> by my next book, if you're <laughs> literally very sad. For example, so many friends of mine were depressed when, you remember, two years ago, when was it? Yes, uh, after uh, uh, the, uh, uh, the uh, 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 when uh, the, the Trumpian crowd entered uh, Congress, occupies it. You know that my, many of my leftist friends were crying. They said, my God, we should have been doing it, the people. <laughs> and this is the thing, sad thing today. Even the Leninist violent upheaval topic is taken over by the, uh, by the alt-right, so that this liberal left, did you notice how all they can do is, they call for police, like all my leftist liberal friends were saying, where was the National Guard there? Uh, saying, where was the police? And so on and so on. And not to mention guys really disgusting, like Steve Bannon, the maybe most intelligent uh, 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 theorist, ideologist of Trump, Trumpism, he proclaimed himself openly a Leninist. He said, I'm the only serious Leninist today, because like for Lenin, my task is to uh, destroy the state apparatus, so that the people take it over. Now, I know what you will say. This is only a mask of the privileged, the big capital and so on. But my point is, it doesn't matter. This engenders uh, an incredible surplus enjoyment. To continue watching this video, click the link in the top left or in the description below. Or visit iai.tv for more debates and talks from the world's leading thinkers on today's biggest ideas.